Hello, we're live. Happy hidden hour. It's December 23rd, a week, or a week, a day and a half. Uh, it's Christmas Eve Eve, according to Phoebe on Friends. And uh, we're grateful to be here with all of you. Um, I'm taking it easy, as you can see. So um, I think I'm just getting cozy. The holidays are here. And I have on my Mary sweatshirt. And John, you you don't own an ugly sweater. Someone suggested we wear our ugly Christmas sweaters. Um, uh, we, we both have ugly in our closets. But as far as ugly Christmas, that's a whole other thing. So... Yeah, you you so and you I think you gave away what ugly Christmas sweaters I had you gave away to Goodwill. So so I'm I'm left with this red semi holiday looking Costco shirt. I don't know the red doesn't seem to stick out tonight, but it is red for those who don't believe me. Yeah. I don't think I got rid of any of your clothes at Goodwill. I I mean there are some things I wish I could give away. <laughs> but I don't, I don't think I do that. And I actually got this one at Goodwill. So um, I don't know if I did that. But oh. <clears throat> um, we, we will get on with our show. We'll get on with our show. And we're so grateful that all of you are here tonight. Um, before we begin, we are going to talk, be talking, as you all know, about Ruby Frankie, who pleaded guilty to a charge that I'm not going to say. And, and that's what I want to bring up. We want to follow YouTube's rules for content. And it seems that whenever we talk about this case, that is when John and I um, fail. YouTube uh, <laughs> gives us warnings and lets us know or they demonetize our content. And so we are going to try very, very careful, uh, carefully not to say certain words that have affected us when we talk about this case because we want to be able to keep talking about this case and um, honor YouTube's uh, again rules. So uh, I guess I want to say this because I think it's going to feel like sometimes I'm, I hope most of us here all know about this case. If not, go listen to our, our other, our other podcasts. It might feel like we're trying to, um, you know, uh, through being sensitive, it might sound like we're trying to, what's the word I'm looking for, John? I just minimize. forgot the word. Minimize. minimize, minimize what Ruby Frankie has, um, been charged with or Jody Hildebrandt has been charged with. And I want you to know that is not the case as, as you see, I'm not even going to say what her charges are, but I think we all know. And she pleaded guilty to them. We want to talk in detail about what that entails and we want to be able to bring up the victims, but I think you guys understand we're not trying to minimize anything and a request that in chat as well, maybe kind of watch your words because chats can also be taken down by YouTube if certain words are picked up by their robots. So anyway, I uh, just want you guys to know that we're, we're, we are horrified by this case and uh, our hearts are with the victims and uh, we're not going to bring up ages or things like that. So um, I think that covers it. And what else? We have a couple other announcements before we begin. Book club, and we were on Annie Elise. What do you want? What do you want to talk about first? Why don't you tell everyone about this week, this month's book club, John, or documentary club, whatever it is, this week? <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we're going to be on Wednesday uh, evening at six o'clock p.m. Pacific time. We're going to be talking about uh, a documentary called Dear Zachary. A letter to a son about his father. It's it's been a highly rated documentary. I think it's 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 certainly fascinating, and um, I hope many of you can watch it and join us. Uh, it's like an hour and a half long. It's not super long to watch, so it should be a fairly quick review to to take a you know view to to take a look at it. And um, I hope to see you guys Wednesday night. Yes. And for those that want to join Dr. Babe's documentary club and book club every other week, uh, one's a documentary. This month is a documentary and next week's a book. Uh, you can head to patreon.com slash hidden true crime to join. Um, it's, it's really cool. Once a month, everyone gets together on zoom and you get to pick Dr. John's brain and discuss these books and documentaries. Um, also this week, 
we were on a podcast with Annie Elise and I should have had the links before I jumped on. Uh, but I, I would love to share that. We're talking about this case, actually. Uh, we go in deep with Annie Elise. If many of you are familiar with her channel, uh, John, um, what do you have the links with you? I, I if, if, uh, if any of our moderators are here and have the links, I did not come prepared. <laughs> I will look them up while, while you talk. Okay. So yeah, anyway, we, we covered some similar material that we talk, we'll be talking about now on Annie Elise. So um, we just want to give a shout out to her and her podcast and thank her for having us on. Are you there? What? Okay. Are you having a, a mic problem? I'm... I just muted myself while I type. Keep. I have nothing else to say. Go ahead, babe. Oh. Well, I, I think we want to jump into the uh, the guilty pleas. So that would require some video. Can you? Can you? Okay. Everyone was talking about on Facebook today how you've come so far and you're more relaxed on camera, but I still haven't been able to get John to fill silence. <laughs> well, that's because I need the video to fill the silence. <laughs> oh, you know, with small talk, with small talk, with, uh, you know, hey, Lauren must be getting something. <laughs> okay, what do you need? Um, why don't we just play the video of the of the court appearance that Ruby made. Okay. And then, um, are you going to tell me, are you going to wave to tell me when to stop it or you can just talk, go ahead. I, I think it's pretty short. Why don't we just play it and we'll, we can talk about it after. Miss Frankie is now here. <laughs> Mr. Winward, we are scheduled for a waiver hearing. Is there going to be a waiver today? There will, plus a plea agreement, Your Honor. All right. I'll ask the bailiff to hand you if it's been executed. All right. Mr. Winward, you have discussed with Ms. Frankie a preliminary hearing, what's involved in a preliminary hearing. She understands she has a right to a preliminary hearing on all of the charges in the case she understands what the charges are and she's prepared to waive a preliminary hearing in the case on all charges she is and that is contained in this agreement on page seven as well very good all right i've been handed a plea agreement and it appears to be signed by ms frankie ms frankie did you sign this agreement yes and you did that today when did you sign it on the 18th okay You've read it carefully? Every word. Your signature represents to the court that you've read it carefully, that you understand what you've read, and that you agree to all of the terms. Is that all accurate? Yes. You've had sufficient time to ask questions of your counsel, to go over any questions you have. You're ready to go forward. Yes. You don't need any more time. I'm ready. Ms. Frankie, is anyone pressuring you to enter into this agreement? No. Anyone promising you anything I haven't been told about? No. Anything that's not in the written plea agreement? No. Are you under the influence of alcohol or drugs today? No. Is there anything today that could in any way interfere with your ability to understand the agreement, its consequences, anything? No. No physical condition, no medication, nothing? No. Any further record, counsel? No, Your Honor. Mr. Winward, we ready to proceed? We are ready to proceed. All right, then. <clears throat> Ms. Frankie, how do you plead to count one aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony? Guilty. To count three, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony. Guilty. To count five, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony. Guilty. 
Guilty. And to count six, aggravated child abuse, a second degree felony. With my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and my children, guilty. There is a factual basis set forth in the agreement that is a stipulated factual basis, counsel. That's correct, Your Honor. That is correct, Judge Walton. The court finds that the factual basis is sufficient. All of the terms of the agreement are stipulated, including that the court obtain a pre-sentence investigation report, correct? Correct. There won't be any argument about whether a prison is the appropriate sentence, and there's an agreement about uh, the four counts running consecutive. That is correct. All right, the court finds then that Ms. Frankie's pleas are made knowingly and voluntarily. The court therefore accepts and enters those pleas. The court orders the preparation of a pre-sentence investigation report to be prepared by APNP and the Department of Corrections. Counsel, what about sentencing on February 20th? I think, uh, do, you, do you and your client agree to waive time, counsel? We do agree to waive time, Your Honor. February 20th, I believe, is a Tuesday. Is that right? Okay, I think we're 20, 10 a.m. That works for us, okay. Your Honor. All right. All right. All right, let's discuss. So the questions are pouring in. Okay, already. yeah. So let's let's start with the when the judge asks if she's read the plea deal, she says instead instead of saying yes, she says every word. That is actually a question that we received on our Facebook page. I have it here. Do you think that Ruby's last guilty with extra wording was sincere or was it setting the stage to get a lesser punishment? But we'll let you tell us what you yeah, think. Yeah, we'll get to that. Night. But I just want to, let's go through it, uh, you know, sort of um, from beginning to end. And so that she's, when she says every word, it's interesting because she's, I think she's, what she's saying is that she wants this to be taken seriously. Like she's saying, she's, instead of just saying, yes, did you read the whole thing? Most defendants will say, yes. She says every word. You know, there's, there's a, I think there's a, there's an implication here that she's saying, yes, I'm, I am serious today and I'm, I'm going to be contrite. And so she's really kind of setting the stage for her later statement about with my deepest regret and sorrow. Right. So she, she adds that into the fourth count. So by the way, we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about what this means in a second, but I think the every word part is interesting because it, it um, you know, she's, she's, She's sending the message that she's serious and that she might, there might be some contrition here um, that's going to follow. And she, she tries that when she's, she's, she talks about the fourth count. I think the, the big question everyone wants to know is, is she really expressing remorse? And, yes. and that's, um, that, that's, that's, that's a tough one, but um, let's, let's, let's think about that. So, so she says the every word because, you know, she wants the judge to know that she's not kidding around. And then when she when she throws out this bombshell about with my deepest regret and sorrow for my family and children, and she says guilty for the fourth count, she's obviously kind of emphasizing that point. You know, she's trying to emphasize the point that she's experiencing remorse or has experienced remorse. Um one of the interesting things in terms of looking at her body language, and again, I, you know, I, I'm always a little cautious about body language analysis because it's not an exact science and there's a lot of ambiguity in reading body language. But, but if there's any body language expert, it is a psychologist, technically. You guys are trained in nonverbal. Well, we're, we're trained to read the expressions of our clients, let's say that. But I mean, it's not, uh, the, or more specifically, I'm trained to pay attention to emotions and to micro 
maybe kind of micro gestures on the face that 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 might indicate certain emotions. I think the question for me with body language is always what does this have to what is the client feeling and what are they conveying through that emotion? So, yes. you know, to to look at to look at body language and say, oh, they're lying or not lying, I mean, that's I don't know. I, I think the way you get to that is by looking at emotion. But um, so let's, let's, let's talk about that with her. So one of the things that if you pay attention closely, I don't know if people noticed, but she closes her eyes quite a bit. Yes. She's closing her eyes a, a number of times here. And, you know, so there's a couple ways I think that can be interpreted. One is she's trying to hold off emotions. So maybe, maybe she's feeling overwhelmed by certain emotions. Maybe she's feeling overwhelmed with, I don't know, guilt, let's say. Maybe she's feeling some sense of shame. But there, there's two ways, I think, that, you, that I would interpret the eyes closing. One is that, is that she's, she's closing her eyes because she doesn't want to be present mm -hmm. to see the judge and to see what's going on. And she's kind of trying to, she's feeling emotion and she's trying to shut it down. So I think that's, that's one possible interpretation of that. The other is that she's closing her eyes and she's, she's actually trying to find the emotions. She's actually closing her eyes to kind of check in with herself. She's, there's an interiority going on. There's an internal sense in which she's looking inward. She's trying to figure out what it is she's feeling and she's trying to pull up that emotion for like an yes. actor would, like an actor or actress would, right? And like so, she's trying to fill it. She's searching for it. She's searching for the emotion. So she's either trying to shut it down or she's trying to pull it up. And so, uh, you know, her, her voice, the argument for the latter would be that there's a, there is a little bit of quit. If you listen closely in the beginning, her voice kind of quivers a little bit. It's a little shaky. And that would indicate possibly anxiety or um, maybe some type of remorse or shame. Um, you know, there, 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 there's something there it, or it could be, you know, it could be embarrassment that she's even in this situation, right? It's hard to know exactly, but, but I think the, the quivering voice would kind of indicate that well, I, I could go either way on this. Actually, she 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 because she's not. You can tell there's some emotion in her voice with, with her fourth count where she says, "With my deepest regret and sorrow." But again, I don't know. I don't have the sense. I don't know. I you know, it's it's. Do I think that's authentic? Um, I, I don't know. I'm I'm on the I'm on the fence here. I think. It, it I sounds, love the I don't know answer, by the way. Most people need to say I don't know these days. Keep going. Keep giving us your thoughts. Well, it, it's complicated. It's complicated because I think you have to look at history. When Ruby and Jody, if people remember, when you if you go back to when these when, when to some of the initial hearings, Ruby's first response was essentially to say, and Jody's responses were to say that the victims were a danger to the community and that they were kind of justifying their behavior, right? So certainly at that time, there was no remorse at all. In fact, they were blaming the victims. So the question is, can somebody in a period of, let's say, four, four to six months, four to five months, can they become remorseful? Can they, can they, develop the ability to see the wrongfulness of their actions and express some remorse or guilt. And I mean, I guess the answer is yes, but, but based on that initial appearance in court for their first hearings, when they, they both kind of blame the victims, um, you know, and also the fact that if, if you look at this case and you look at the amount of time that this abuse was going on, you know, for, which was a period of years that right. they're not being charged for that. But I mean, if you go back and look at that, like where was her remorse then? Right. Like, you know, it, it, this is complicated because when you throw in history, 
you know, you have to look at these, you have to look at what she's doing here in the context of who she is and what she's done in the past and how she's reacted in the past. And I think in that sense, I think it becomes more difficult to see this as genuine remorse, Hmm. but we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit, but I mean, I think there's some emotion there. The question is whether she's trying to shut it down or express it. And you know, I could go either way on that. Actually. I, I think initially she's closing her eyes because she's trying to shut down emotion, Hmm. but it still comes through. Okay. Okay. Uh, that makes sense. I think of improv in high school when I was trying to get into a character, right? In drama class in high school. And it's true that I want to feel what my character would feel, right? Like, so I get up there and they're like, hey, you're this person and you've just been fired from your job and you are afraid to, you know, uh, you might be homeless in the next week and start, right? That's drama class in high school. And it's true. You kind of close your eyes. You soak it in because you're trying to get into the character, but it's genuine for me. I'm like genuinely trying to feel what a person in that situation might feel. You know, I'm trying to feel empathy for this character. I don't know. Is that kind of it? It's almost, but if that's the case, it'd almost be like just being disassociated from yourself. I don't know. Is that, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't feel like this is disassociated. I think, I think, but you're getting to an important point, which is that, that Ruby Frankie, has or she had two and a half million i don't know what the numbers were she had a lot of youtube followers two and a half million subscribers followers viewers whatever um and and there's very much a sense in which a big part of her channel was acting Mm -hmm. right that she we know now that that a lot of her a lot of your her youtube videos and um shows were staged we know that there that, that she's created this huge facade about this family and she's trying to present this p- particular curated image of how perfect her family was and how to raise children right and we know now from talking to, you know listening to people and talking to some sources that that a lot of that was just not accurate at all i mean so so i i think i think that's the dilemma here you know is she has she in the last six months de- all of a sudden developed this capacity for self-insight and self-reflection and she's really done some soul searching and all of a sudden she's going to show up in court and say that she re- has regrets and sorrow and it's genuine, right? Like, so that would require a bit of, tr- of personal transformation. That would require some real thought and some soul searching and right. And so that, that's what she wants us to believe. The other side of that, though, is this is someone who's had a YouTube channel and she's literally been an actress of sorts or or not of sorts. She has been an actress because her channel is all fake. Um, It's trying to present an image, a curated image to monetize it. So. So is she acting? Is this straight from Dr. John? Her whole YouTube channel is fake. You hear you heard it here tonight. (laughs) That was bold. <laughs> well, okay, that might have been a little strong, but you know, the, <laughs> sometimes, sometimes, um, sometimes you have to resort to hyperbole to make a point. So that's what I'm doing. So, let, but I like it now that you say it. I like it. Yes. Um, not well. How do I? Maybe not our whole YouTube channel, but quite a bit of it is fake. So quite a bit of it. Quite a well, bit explain of it. fake. Explain fake because the people in it are real. Well, the people are real. That's true. But so what I'm so think of it like this: that that we know we now know that many of her uh, of she was creating conflict in a lot of her episodes to draw in more viewers. And the way she did that is they would stage certain scenarios, or they would stage certain rescues, or. There were certain things, a lot of things that were being staged that weren't a- an accurate depiction of what was really going on. So in other words, if somebody gets hurt, you know, you just assume that that's real. If you're uh, presumably, if you're watching a, a, a reality show, um, 
But in, in the case of this particular channel, a passengers, a lot of times people weren't getting hurt. They were, they were, they were using props and they were using, it was all staged. And they were doing it, they were finding ways to create drama, to spread the word about how great their channel was, to get more viewers, to make more money, right? It all fed on itself. Correct. And so that's what I mean is that, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, you and I show up here week after week and we, we, it's not scripted. You know, we, we talk about cases. We don't necessarily, we have an idea of what we're going to talk about, but we don't know the specifics. Um, it's spontaneous, right? Like it's, 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 it, it, I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine showing up here and just creating these fake scenarios to create drama, right? To bring in more viewers. I mean, it'd probably work. We'd probably have a lot more viewers. I mean, we love our gems. So we're quite- Right, we're if we quite... could get like grandpa to fall asleep every week. Yeah, People right. love that, yeah. you know? Yeah, but, that, but that was authentic. Like, you know, right. that's what I'm that. saying. Yeah, you know, yeah. and then we realize, wow, people love that. Let's make it happen again next week. You know, no, actually, he doesn't get a babysit next week because we don't ever want that happening again. Right. So a, a, a stage scenario would be, let's say, and I'm just this, this didn't happen. I hope this doesn't happen. But if grandpa was babysitting and grandpa tripped and hurt himself and we had to get an ambulance and get help for him. Right. And let's say the, but let's say that. We said that and it wasn't true. And all of a sudden an ambulance shows up at the house and we pretend like grandpa's hurt and he's not. Right. That's what I mean. That's that's the kind of thing they were doing. Right. And they were doing that because it would create a lot of drama and it would create a lot of excitement and they would make more money. They'd get more viewers. That's how you apparently get two and a half million viewers on YouTube. So, so what does that mean? So what does that mean then? Because you know, there are a lot of YouTube channels out there that are aka fake. Right. Um, right. And I don't, I can't, I don't know those channels well enough to comment, but what it means essentially is that there's this very inauthentic picture of this family, <laughs> that this family is not presenting themselves as they are. They're not being real. They're not, they're not, we're not learning who this family really is. And we know too, from, from a few people who have come out that, that this is a family. I don't know. I don't want to get into this too much. But this is a family who off camera was doing some pretty crazy things. So just one example would be that this is a family who obviously didn't, they're a Mormon family who didn't condone substance use or substance abuse. And yet they were partying and using a lot of substances. And I mean, that's fine. People can do what they want if, if they're not, you know, breaking the law or harming other people, in my opinion. But, you know. That's fine, but just don't tell me. Don't present your family as if as if you're this perfectly moral, upstanding, right bunch of people that that abides by certain moral codes when you don't, right? That's the that's the issue. Well, you're getting into a, a question I want to ask, which is, you know, Marcella, thank you. This is a question from Marcella. She left it on our Facebook page. Uh, facebook.com slash hidden true crime. When we asked people for their questions, she said, what kind of person, uh, what kind of person wouldn't know that this type of discipline was over the top and cruel as a mom of three and grandmother of seven, I would never allow anyone to even recommend this type of treatment. Ruby is definitely missing the mother gene. So, so does that lead us here though? A little bit like, you know, if. Well now, yeah. So now, so this is, this is the cost, I think, the cost of developing a YouTube channel where most stuff is staged, a lot of it's staged, a lot of it's not authentic. The, the, the cost of doing that is that your family become, and I don't know, there's certain words we can't use here, but, but that what happens is your children become like props. That your children, your children are commodities. So... And and again, I mean, this wouldn't be just, this isn't just true of the Frankies. This would be true of a lot of child stars. Michael Jackson was an extraordinarily talented human being, but he didn't have much of a childhood, right? Because he was, I think in many ways, his father saw him as, as some someone to monetize, or he saw, his father saw 
Michael Jackson as a commodity, something that he could use, an object he could use to get rich. And so, uh, so I don't want to say this is only true of the Frankies. It's not. It's true of a lot of entertainment, probably, and child actors and child stars. But in this particular case, I think you you have a situation where the children are commodities. And if you want to really start dehumanizing someone, then just see your kids as objects. See them as, as right? See them as a paycheck. Treat them, stage everything. Don't see them for who they are. Don't listen to them. Don't give them an authentic voice. Just put them on the screen the way you need to. Let them act or do whatever it is you're trying to do to create drama um, and, and, and monetize that. And, you know, you're moving in the direction. When you do that, you're moving in the direction of dehumanization. Ah. Dehumanization. It always comes down to dehumanization when you can do things like this to people. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. I'll, there's a great quote I want to read at the end about that. But yes, dehumanization, I think, is w- certainly one of the underlying components of almost every crime. It starts with it. It starts with that. So in other words, on our YouTube channel, I mean, yeah, there's so much we got to get into. There are so many questions here, but on her YouTube channel, we're seeing dehumanization of our children already. In other words. Right, exactly. So if you want, I think if we're trying to figure out how you get to this type of horrendous abuse, and we haven't talked about that yet, but we will. I Let's think call you have it to trauma. Go- Let's call it trauma from now on. And I said that other word we were trying to avoid. Trauma. Too. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Um, if you want to get to the traumas that occurred, I think you, you, you can go back even further. I think you, you probably want to start with the family culture, obviously. And in fact, in fact, one of the most interesting things about this case was the response of a couple of the sisters. I think it would be interesting to play. <coughs> excuse me. I think it would be interesting to play uh, the response from Bonnie actually, because I think that would be a good way to start thinking about this. Okay, here we go. This feels like a very impossible video to make. I know that. Yeah. So, so this is just to clear. So this is Bonnie. This is Ruby's sister. Bonnie also has uh, immensely successful YouTube channel with a million and a half subscribers. She's also making lots of money, probably millions of dollars. I guess Ruby was making millions of dollars apparently. And Bonnie is getting on here to, to, well, to distance herself from her sister, obviously, because people were asking questions to her. But, um, what's interesting about the, the segment you just played is her initial response is to blame Ruby and Jody for basically going rogue and leaving the family, right? So notice how in the first three minutes of this video, actually there's there's no mention whatsoever of the victims. So there's there's no concern whatsoever for her niece and nephew that have experienced this horrendous trauma. She's only concerned about herself. She's only concerned about how this impacts her channel, how it's going to impact her channel. She's blaming. So she's rationalizing the trauma by essentially blaming Jody. Right. And if you go to, let's, let's pick this up at around six minutes. Cause it gets even more, it gets even more interesting. Okay. Hold on. This has hurt person in our family and watching it hurt my husband makes me mad I have stood by Joel's side building our home and it sounds incredibly selfish to given all the facts be thinking of our house but all so so let so again 
No mention whatsoever of the victims. No mention of how no mention of how horrendous her sister's behaviors have been, right? What she's concerned about here is losing her house. I mean, I give her I give her a little bit of credit for recognizing how selfish it is, selfish it is. She does say that. She says she I does know this say thing. that. She does say that. So I acknowledge that she does say that, but she says, I know this must look selfish, but <laughs> I don't care. But I don't I'm care because you. because my husband's working on this house, which presumably this is probably a super expensive house, but uh, and I, I, I guess they probably worked on this house for their channel or it's part of their channel. So the two go together the way I take it, that she's worried about losing money for because she'll be associated with her sister. So she's worried about the health and well-being of her channel and whether she will continue to make money. And she's worried about losing her house. That's her focus. This is Ruby's sister. You might say, well, why is that important? It's important because it shows you what this family values. There's another sister who made a statement too. Her name is Julie. Julie spoke for about five or six minutes. She also talked about her house. She too has a YouTube channel. She has a YouTube channel of 250,000 subscribers, which for most YouTube channels like ourselves, that's a big channel. It's way bigger than ours is. And and she too talked about her house. She too talked about the impact on her channel. What she didn't talk about was the impact on the victims. She didn't talk about how it affected her. She didn't comment on her sister's behavior and how horrendous it was, right? And so here we have two instances of a family culture that's showing almost no empathy. So you have, so even though I don't know a lot about Ruby, Frankie's family and upbringing, I know from listening to her sisters and their statements that this is a family culture with low to no empathy, right? We can gather that right away because right. when, when the sisters come on publicly and all they have to say is I'm worried about losing my house and I've worked so hard to build this channel, like, Ah, uh, okay. I mean, there's, uh, there's obviously, selfish. Yeah. Right. There's, there's obviously a complete lack of self-awareness there, but it also shows you what they value. They value money. They value material things, their houses. They, they're not valuing relationships. They're not showing any empathy. And I should also point out that Bonnie on our channel, we're not going to show it here. We don't have time, but Bonnie has talked about blanket trading in terms of disciplining her children. Blanket trading at people that have followed us. We've talked about this previously. Blanket trading, in my opinion, is a form of child abuse. So essentially you put a toddler, you put a six-month-old, a year-old child on a blanket. If the child strays from the blanket, you essentially paddle them, hit them. You, do, you, you show them essentially that staying on the blanket means that they're obeying and leaving the blanket means they're not obeying. So you're trying to discipline that child in a very abusive way. You're doing it in such a way, by the way, that at such a young age, it's going to stick with them for many, many years, if not for life. So you're essentially breaking your children. You're breaking your children's spirit, let's right. say, at a very, very young age. That's what blanking training is. No two. So no, it's important to know that Bonnie and the sisters endorse blanket training as a viable disciplinary parenting method. So if you know about that, and you know about this lack of empathy and how they're responding to their sister, you're start, we're starting to learn a lot about this family culture. This is a family culture that obviously values harsh and strict discipline, and this is a family culture that lacks empathy. So if you, yes. take, those in two, if you take those two ingredients and you, 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 you inject them into the Ruby Frankie side of things, and you 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 add the fact that their YouTube channel is so popular and she's making so much money from it, it's not hard to see how this is going to lead to something bad. Right? You're, because right. even right. before she meets, even before Ruby meets Jody, 
this is already set up to be a disaster. There were already, the reason Ruby claims that, that, that she, she was largely responsible for leaving her channel because she wanted to rescue her kids. That's what she told Jody because she realized that her children were living in distortion. But that's not the reality. The reality is YouTube took the channel down because there were a lot of concerns about her parenting practices. And so even prior to meeting Jody Hildebrandt, you have a very explosive situation here. You have a family culture of strict discipline, no empathy. The children are being treated as props. You're trying to create maximum drama to grow your channel. You're monetizing everything at your children's expense, at their the child at the expense of their childhoods, healthy childhoods. You're you're being punitive when they don't behave in the way you want for your shows, right? This is all going to add up to problems. You're dehumanizing your kids. So so Ruby Frankie is dehumanizing her kids before she even meets Jody. And then when she meets Jody and she's introduced to this ideology of distortion and sin and possession and evil spirits, when, when all of that enters in, now you've created the perfect storm for some type of trauma. And that's exactly what happens. Let's talk about what Nancy Stewart said. And Elizabeth, thank you for your comment too, that I, pinned and like oh that was that was great blanket training also discourages curiosity is what elizabeth said you know learning and seeing your world um around you but nancy stewart saying i think the reason the sisters didn't mention the kids is that the judge asked them not to and that, that just, is what she said on the video that's what right and that's false because um well <laughs> First off, she never says nobody's told me not to mention any victims. And what's wrong with saying that? Why can't you just say that? The judge asked me <coughs> not to mention any victims or the people that have been traumatized or those I care about. There are people I care about that I'm worried about, but I can't mention them. It's a cop out. It's yeah. a cop out. If the if first of all, I don't know what involvement she had with the judge. But so I don't I don't think the judge told her anything. I don't either. The judge is that and that's what I was gonna say as a as a reporter and as a journalist, judges don't say, hey, judges by the way, uh, hey, by the way, I'm I'm gonna gather the perpetrator's family um to let them know that you know, I'd really appreciate it if you just didn't mention the pain and the sorrow. Yeah. It's See a, how it's that a, goes. Watch, watch uh, you know, the 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 university of Idaho's parents say, oh, okay, we just won't mention, you know, our pain yeah. or the victim. But it's, it's a cop out. It's not real. The ju judges don't, I mean, if there was a gag order on the case towards the families, I, we would have known about that. There's as far as I know, there's no gag order. Also, as Lauren just pointed out, it, it's, it <laughs> gag orders usually pertain to specific instances of of trauma that can't be discussed they don't apply to blanket statements about my heart right you just as you just said my heart goes out to my niece and nephew i'm so sorry this happened to them that would not be part of a gag order that's that's a perfectly reasonable statement for someone to make it's not on their it's radar right so it's not what they want to talk about or they don't right, want and, to talk also, about it a judge isn't going to reach out to someone who doesn't live in the state of Utah. I don't think Bonnie lives somewhere else, right? Like, I mean, somebody who lives out of state that's family. So I think when she says that, what she means is my parents. She probably means my parents don't want us to talk about this. I don't, it's just, it's not about a Shame. judge. Right. And actually, I think in my opinion, made it worse that she said that because it made me realize she's aware and now purposely not bringing up what we should really be caring about and then says, I can't believe how this is affecting me, me. <sighs> right. Exactly. So, I mean, I, you know, I'm sorry, but yeah, no, this isn't about a judge shutting things down. This is about a family that doesn't know how to express empathy. So correct. Or don't family, want to a family I mean, culture. The, fa the fact that, that she even put that cop out out there 
which would be a lie, or as you point out, it's probably her mom or dad. The fact that she put that cop out out there also makes me imply that she's almost conscious that she's doesn't care, but she still feels entitled to doing this video and feeling bad for herself. Like if, if, you know, and, and if a judge said, Hey, by the way, you probably can't really talk about this. The victims would be like, well, what's the point of doing the video then? Because that's the only thing I'm worried about. Right. Exactly. Well, the, point of, the point of doing the video is to let her followers know that she's not her sister and that she still wants to keep her home. So she still wants to make money, which obviously this materialism and this monetization of these channels is critical to this family. The big part of this family culture is clearly monetization and not relationships. Right. And so, I mean, if we're trying to understand how you can get to this type of trauma with the, the children, then I think these are some of the key pieces. Yeah. Yeah. But then let's come full circle then, unless you have something else. But it makes me feel like, are we saying then that Jody is not to blame at all? <laughs> no, no, I think because she just she, Ruby just threw Jody under the bush, uh, under the bush, the bush. I said the bush. I don't know the burning bush, the bus. <laughs> I think you you look way too comfortable on your your new couch. <laughs> yes, I have a new couch, guys. That's why I'm here. John's like, really, you're gonna go live there? I'm like, it is. It is Christmas Eve Eve. I'm in my Mary sweatshirt in a just got a new couch for um we sold the guest bed the guests now have to sleep on a couch because i got myself a couch <laughs> right anyway. somebody i noticed somebody earlier said really lauren you're 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 gonna do the show from your bed oh yeah i'm not in bed this is welcome to my new couch so <laughs> so in the um in the guilty plea agreement the there's a couple of there's some some components of the, the there's something I should read here about how um they they, they talk about indo the indoctrination of the victims and uh it, I'll just um one of the victims was indoctrinated and they were trying to convince him that quote he was evil and possessed. He was, and this is another quote, he was also told that everything that was being done to him were acts of love. An another one of the victims, it says that this victim, EF, quote, EF was convinced that she was evil and needed to go through these things in order to repent. Quote, she was also repeatedly told that she was evil and possessed. So those are the components that when you, so... You have, if you have this family culture of harsh discipline, low empathy, monetization of their YouTube channel, seeing their children as commodities, and then you bring Jody in with this idea of possession and evil spirits and repentance, right? And not living in distortion. Now you have, you have a perfect storm for the most horrendous type of trauma you can imagine. And, and that's what we get here. So I won't, I won't give you guys specifics, but in the plea agreement, essentially, this is what happened with the children. There was physical torture. Wait, 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 you give it, give it a little bit of a break because you said a word and then you went into the okay. victims. So let's just, so didn't I say victims? No. no. <laughs> okay. This is so hard. Yeah. So, um, Go ahead. Debbie, thank you. Thank you so much, Debbie. Uh, especially at this end of the year, you mean so much to us uh, for always supporting us, believing in us. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who's believed in us and supported us this year as the year is almost coming to an end. Go ahead. Yeah, we're really, we're really grateful for the support of our gems. You guys are an amazing community. And um, thank you for being there with us, for us. And giving us feedback and some great chats. We really, really appreciate it. Yes. Okay. Go ahead. In the plea deal. So what, these are some of the things the victims endured physical torture. They were hog tied. They were starved. They were nearly drowned. The term you use is waterboarded. 
I don't think it was exactly waterboarding, but um, the way it's described in here is, quote, holding the victim's head underwater, which could be a form of waterboarding. There was strangulation. So, quote, cutting off oxygen by place, Ruby placing her hands over the mouth and nose. That's strangulation. There was social isolation. Um, I, you know, it's the trauma that these victims went through was, was horrendous. If you guys want to read the specifics, it's in the plea deal, but in summary, those are, those are sort of the main points. So torture, near drowning, strangulation, starvation, social isolation, it goes on and on. I read the entire, for those that want to understand the entire plea deal, I do have the, I read the entire thing. It's been demonetized, which is why we're not, but it is there for anyone that wants to know uh, the entire plea deal. I, I expected it to be demonetized, but I wanted to read it without censoring it. And it's on our channel. If Ahmad is listening, maybe you guys can grab that link of the uh, plea deal reading. And so for those that, that want to understand it, it is horrendous and and that you know and that's i think maybe something else i want to ask you about too is we can ask later but what the victims um are going to go through and what you know it's so sad um but we we can talk about some other things for jody or how yeah in terms of in terms of in terms of recovering from this, yeah, it's, 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 you know, every victim's different. So some, some victims are highly resilient and they may need less help. Some aren't, it really depends. So I think it'll depend on the individual, but uh, I wouldn't expect, I wouldn't be surprised to see some type of uh, post-traumatic stress disorder here. So in other words, some type of PTSD, I wouldn't be surprised to see some struggles with depression lifelong struggles with depression. I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, problems around anxiety or anxiety disorders. Uh, that would be a separate from trauma, just generalized anxiety disorder, maybe. Uh, I'm speculating, of course, but um, insomnia typically might go along with some of this. There would probably be some issues around anger and anger management. There's probably going to be issues around relationships and trust in relationships, especially when your mother is the one doing this. So this, these, these kids are probably going to struggle for a long time with developing healthy and trusting relationships. And, you know, that's, that's the real tragic part of this whole story. Yeah. I think that's, you know, and, and to, you know, even though we're not bringing up the victim's ages to consider their ages too, I can't help, but just bring that up. But yeah, they were young. They were pre-adolescent. So it's, it's going to be, you know, I, I hope they can heal and I hope there's some resilience there, but it's, it's, it's probably going to be a long, hard road for the victims. And as you said, my, you know, my heart goes out to them. It's to, to actually see what we had some idea of what happened with the victims, but to actually see it in writing and to, to read it, it's, it's shocking. I'm glad they're alive. Me too. And, and that's one thing I want to bring up to someone said to me, do you think this could have ended bad? Oh, it was uh, Mormon stories. I was on with uh, John Dillon, Mormon stories discussing this as well. The, the plea deal. And he said, do you think this would have ended? Could have ended even worse. And, and I said, absolutely. But one thing I want to bring up is it's not me that's saying that that's the probable cause. The probable cause states life threatening injuries. Their lives right. were threatened. That's not from me. That's from the pol the police report, the initial police report. And something I always bring up from the probable cause too, the, the day they arrested both Jody and Ruby, is the fact that once they rescued RF, victim RF, and they went back to the house to rescue EF, little EF, that they had to, to try for about four hours according to the probable cause to convince EF to let them help her 
four hours. I just, that's something I've repeated a lot, but I think that's the oft overlooked part of the probable cause. Like it shows already a lot of the trauma, like that, that here's someone that's willing to help her. And she, she is so afraid that she can't be helped. Well, on that point, I read the, the, from the written plea agreement, I read the quote earlier about how quote EF was convinced that she was evil and needed to go through these things in order to repent. So that's, so in other words, she internalized that she internalized the trauma and believed that it was justified that it, that she deserved that trauma. And so talk about, talk about internalizing a negative sense of self or poor self-esteem. I mean, this is someone who is going to, it's going to take a lot of work probably just to convince her that she's worthy and that she doesn't deserve that type of trauma. Right. And just to repair that sense of self, I think is going to be a major project because they had convinced her. They had led her to believe that she was evil. And I mean, that in and of itself for such, for such a young child is, is going to be hugely traumatic. And the, and the people that she was supposed to trust the most. I mean, this is before the age of even being able to understand how people can manipulate. It's just. So then. Going back to my question, then. Many people, many people that we've interviewed have said to us. Jody Hildebrandt is to blame. Adam Steed said Jody Hildebrandt is to blame. He was a victim of Jody Hildebrandt. That's on our channel. Jesse on Mormon Stories with John DeLynn, the niece of, of Jody Hildebrandt, they said, they said Jody Hildebrandt is the mastermind behind this. Right. Ruby is saying as much here. So the question is, because there were warning signs and because there's a family system and a family culture and we see a lack of empathy and there's all this stuff before Jody. Right. Does that mean that she's think not it, to blame at all? Think of it like Chad and Lori Daybell in the sense okay. that, in the sense that they're Lori's children and there were issues before Lori met Chad, but Chad has this ideology that is very concerning that has to do with possession and evil spirits. Right. And, and I think that's what pushes Lori over the edge that once she buys into that school of thought or into those beliefs, she's much more capable of, of committing heinous acts or crimes. So I think you you have a, a situation here with Ruby where you have kind of the perfect setup and then it gets pushed over the threshold. You kind of reach that tipping point and you you cross that tipping point when Jody enters the picture and starts saying, you know, these kids aren't just props. These kids are also evil. These kids are possessed, right? And I think that really pushes her over the edge that, that at that point, anything's possible. Our wonderful moderator, Steph Budge, said that very thing. Jody may have been the Chad Daybell, but Ruby is Lori Vallow. Neither should get a pass. Right, exactly. They're both, obviously, they're both culpable. And on that issue, by the way, so for those who don't, aren't familiar with these types of deals, plea deals, um, the judge talked about stipulating, and that's an important – so in the court system – when somebody stipulates to something, that means that they've agreed in advance that that's going to, going to occur. And what he means by that is, so for example, if, if I do a forensic evaluation, let's say on someone who um, has committed a, a heinous crime, sometimes the parties won't stipulate to the terms of a, of a deal. And if they don't stipulate, then oftentimes I, I might, somebody like myself, a forensic psychologist will be brought in to assess risk or to dig a little deeper into mental health issues to give 
the judge or the courts an idea of of future consequences and uh, relevant mental health, health, mental health issues that may have affected the crime. And in other words, to provide a little more insight so that the courts have a little more leverage to, um, to, to work with, you know, to work with attorneys or, or whatever. But so, but when, it, when something is stipulated, that means that it's a done deal. So if I get an evaluation and there's a stipulation that someone's going to spend six years in prison, then my evaluation might have less impact because they've already agreed to prison time and my risk will have my risk assessment, for example, will have less relevance because it's already been stipulated. So a lot of times in forensic psychology, you don't see this, you know, I don't see plea agreements where there's a stipulation because it's still a gray area. It still has to be worked out by the courts. And that's part of my role is to help the courts kind of figure out, depending on which side the prosecution or defense, it's to figure out how the mental health health issues or how those risk issues affect the future or affect the community or affect the proceedings. And so, um, so it's interesting to me. So what this means here is that, she she pled to four counts. There were more counts, by the way. There were a lot more because, I mean, she pled to count one, three, five, and six. I don't remember how initial counts were, but... Six. Pled- there were six total. Okay. There were six total, so it's down to four now. Okay, so she pled to four. Uh, the stipulation, essentially, is that she stipulates she's going to prison. So because the minimum the minimum sentence would be a year on each count, she's she's got to do a minimum of four years. And her max would be her max would be a maximum of sixty years, since the upper end is fifteen years. So by stipulating, essentially, the attorneys are all saying and the judge are saying, you're doing prison time. It's just a question of how much. Yeah, and that's up to the judge, which then someone actually had that question too. Was she uh, being sincerely? Let me find this question. Someone asked pretty much Ruby's future is in the hands of the judge. Um, right. Oh, well, I guess there was actually Melanie Avery's question, which, which I already asked, but do you think that Ruby's last guilty with extra wording was sincere? So it goes back to the original question I read or setting the stage to get a lesser punishment because her, she doesn't have a jury in front of her. Her entire future lies in the judge's hands. Right. And in that sense, in that sense, that's exactly what she's doing. She's playing to the judge. Whatever we think about whether she has remorse or not is, is not, it's much less important than what the judge thinks. Well, there's going to be a psychologist. What would the psychologist, so a psychologist is certainly going to come in and, and give Ruby well, an evaluation. How much weight does that hold? That's not certain. Okay. So there's there's a PSI that's called a pre sentence investigation. It's usually, <coughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm still not over this cold, but um, he isn't. He just he actually was at Quick Care yesterday, guys, and he just got himself some antibiotics. So sorry. Um, so there's 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 something called a PSI that stands for pre sentence investigation. Um, usually, that's done by probation, and probation will make recommendations about sentencing. Sometimes, not all the time, but oftentimes probation will bring in a forensic psychologist to do some type of evaluation. Depends on what they the, what they want to know. Um, but in this particular case, when prison time has already been stipulated, it's not a, it's not a sure bet that a psychologist is going to come in and and evaluate because I'm not sure what they would be assessing. In other okay. words. She's doing prison time, so do they need? They don't necessarily need to assess her risk for community placement. Well, what I mean, what if there is a risk to the community? No, I mean, four years and sixty years is a big difference. Sixty years could put her in there for life. But a but a psychologist wouldn't really. That's that's really up to the courts to determine. Like the psychologist, okay, is not going to assess the length of prison sentence that would be up to a, a judge or jury typically. So, uh, I, but it depends. I mean, they may want to yeah. know, 
there may be some certain mental health health issues they want to know, and they they may want to assess risk. You know that they even with four years, they may want to know. Okay, right now in 2023, does this person have significant risks of being released in the community? And you know, so typically they may want to know that for sentencing, but uh, typically what would happen is after the four years, let's say, or whatever it is, 10 years, when somebody's going to be released on probation or parole, that's when you bring a psychologist in or forensic psychologist in to assess mm-hmm. risk based upon their functioning at that time. Got that makes that, that makes sense. If they're about to be released, let's assess. Right. Because right now, I mean, unless there's some possibility of probation, it, it's, it's, it's not clear that they would use a forensic psychologist at this point. They might. It. It. I don't know. It. It depends on what probation is looking for in their report. Okay. Well, we um, need to conclude soon. What else did you want to cover tonight? I think those are the main points. I did promise that I was going to. I kind of want to read a quote here, um, we, since we talked kind of about. We talked about how dehumanization played such a critical role in all this. Um, This is one of my favorite quotes by, his name is David Cantor. The book is Criminal Shadows. This, in my opinion, is a classic textbook in forensic psychology. David Cantor is a well-known British forensic psychologist. This is page 241 of the Cantor book. And here's what he says, quote, what sorts of hidden stories do criminals live? Question mark. I propose that violent criminals live narratives that share one common constituent. Whenever or, or however it occurs, the theme that links violent attacks on other people is the treating of the victims as less than human. They become objects of anger or desire, vehicles to satisfy the perpetrator, possessions that are jealously guarded, targets for him or her to act upon. This is a reflection of what I have called a lack of empathy for other people, an inability to assign them an active role in their own or or anyone else's life story. From From this view, there is little fundamental difference between murder, rape, violent non sexual assaults, or child molesting. All are onslaughts on other people. They may differ in the target or consequences of their actions, but the central theme is the same. So I, I, I love that quote by Cantor because I don't know if I agree with him that all those crimes are exactly the same, but I think he's saying that the underlying foundation of most criminal acts involves some form of dehumanization and lack of empathy. And you certainly, I think here with Ruby Frankie, you certainly see a huge component of dehumanization. And even if, even if you're dehumanizing your own offspring, right, that's, that's the crazy part. So, so don't think that that doesn't happen because obviously it does. And, these particular types of cases with these types of victims um, make that apparent that I think there's sometimes this myth that, that parents or mothers or fathers, they they're less likely to hurt their own kids. And that's not necessarily the case. Dehumanization can happen anywhere under the right circumstances. For those that have questions about Jody, John and I have done a deep dive on Jody, uh, prior previously and i would recommend our entire playlist our entire ruby frankie playlist uh we do a deep dive into who ruby is or sorry jody is um and it matters to this case and then i also recommend our interview with adam steed a two-part interview Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. I also want to give another shout out to Annie Elise at 10 to Life. I I did not give the link at the beginning. Here's the problem. She has a podcast called Serialistly. Serialistly. Seriously. I can never say it. And that's another reason I didn't say it. 
So I didn't have the link because it's, it's a podcast only, but John and I were honored to collaborate uh, this week with Eni Elise. If, so if you want more of this, I hear some people saying they don't want this to end and we have to take off. Uh, we discuss this in depth over with Annie Elise on her podcast. It is audio only. So head there and thank you to those that are here tonight. Thank you for subscribing. Thank you for hitting uh, like, and then remember John's book club is this week. It's Wednesday, a documentary. We'd love for you to join and you can join us over at patreon.com slash hidden true crime. And it means so much for you to join. Not only uh, is that's just simply a place. If you are willing to support us, head to patreon.com slash hidden true crime. Your su monthly support means so much and it keeps our podcast going and we'll keep it going into the next year. So thank you to those who support us on Patreon, but it's also a place where we do try to give back to our supporters. So we have about a hundred bonus episodes there that have never been seen uh, or heard on YouTube or our podcast, uh, as well as a ton of FOIA docs. We, we get full FOIA docs. We put them all there. And then you have Dr. John's book club. So while we're grateful for those that are on Patreon, just simply to support us and to keep us going it is a place that we truly try to give back. So thank you to those who are Patreon members or are considering to join. And thank you so much to our YouTube members too. We're going to start doing more YouTube uh, membership videos as well. So thank you everyone to all of our supporters as we're nearing this end of this year. That's all I've, I have anything else, babe. Merry Christmas to all and to all a good night. <laughs> yeah. You know what? I, I, I do, I do want to, I do want to end with a little bit of a holiday thought here. Um, I wasn't sure if I was going to bring this up, but just quickly. Um, so I was watching, I was watching, uh, I think it's Santa. I think it's called Santa Claus is coming to town. It's one of the old, uh, claymation specials that, uh, like I forget his name, Rankin, I think was the producer. These were done like in the sixties and seventies. And in this particular one, it was kind of the, this, the origin stories of Santa Claus and Fred Astaire was the narrator of the show. And, you know, I was watching it with our son who's six and, um, the whole show, I kept thinking like, I don't know, maybe, you know, obviously what I do, I think kind of, you know, gives me a jaded perspective on things at time, but, um, I was thinking, you know, well, this doesn't really kind of portray the whole commercial side of Christmas or like, you know, isn't Santa really just kind of the embodiment of the commoditization of Christmas or whatever. And then, um, which, you know, I wasn't going to talk about with our son, but, um, and that, all of that, by the way, since we were doing Ruby this week, it kind of reminded me of Ruby and her YouTube channel and kind of the way she treated her kids. And all of a sudden at the end of the show, uh, Fred Astaire comes on and he gives this kind of this little moving speech about Santa Claus. And he says, he he talks about the lesson that we can learn from Santa Claus. And he says that... Santa's lesson is, quote, to learn to give of ourselves, our talents, love, and hearts. And I don't know why, I don't know why I was so moved by that at the time, but I thought, you know, I really kind of thought that maybe I lost sight of that, right? That maybe I've lost sight of the fact that Santa really is about, in some ways, is about love and selfless love. And, um, and, you know, I, I hope our little guy takes that lesson to heart, you know, that it's not just about getting gifts. It's about more than that. And I, I think that that kind of hit home for me because I didn't expect it, number one, coming from this, you know, claymation Christmas special, but also that I think that in thinking about Ruby Frankie, when I was watching that in our show, I think I also kind of thought that is the antidote to dehumanization. The antidote to dehumanization is, is kind of this selfless act of love that Santa Claus 
you know, Santa Claus doesn't give gifts. He doesn't get gifts back. He gives gifts, right? And so, um, so I really, I really think that you know, I'm trying to keep that in mind this Christmas and the importance of of kind of what Santa Claus symbolizes for our son and how it does really or can really kind of transcend this whole idea of of materialism and and I think again I think that maybe that's one way to deal with this idea of dehumanization we'll end it there that was beautiful thank you babe yep you're welcome thank you everyone and while we are celebrating christmas in our house a a happy holidays to everyone wherever you are yep thanks for joining us thank you we'll see you bye-bye good night